All right, welcome back to the Survival and Basic Badass Podcast with uh, Chuck and John. So I'm Chuck, and uh, today I have John Gilstrap with me, who is an author with a, with 25 novels, and we're going to talk a little bit about everything. So, uh, John, uh, tell us about yourself. How'd you get into writing? How did it all uh, come together? Well, first of all, good morning, and thanks for having me on the show. You know, I have, I, I've never taken a writing class. Well, that's not true. I, I took one in college, and it was a disaster. But the um, writing is just something I've always done for as long, literally for as long as I can remember. I was telling stories to to the page. Uh, my mother said that they were the best things that had ever been written. Uh, looking back, I think she was a little over enthusiastic on the quality of those early stories, but. Um, it's like, you know, some people are avid golfers, some people crochet, you know, they, they just have ways of relaxing and writing has always been mine. And I guess you do it long enough, you figure out some of it and uh, sold my first novel, which is called Nathan's Run. And I wrote it in 94, sold it in 95, came out in 96. And it's been on the run ever since. All your characters, you seem you're pretty uh, action oriented, right? That's where does that come from? I mean, they, well, you know, you're yeah. right in there in the excitement, I think. Well, you try to be. I mean, it's you know, writing boring stories is for other people to do. Um, you know, it's I was a firefighter for 15 years. Um, I was into the hazmat stuff. I've always been I was an explosive safety engineer for a while. Um, so I've always been kind of an adrenaline junkie myself, an avid skier until <laughs> until my back said, no, you're not. Um and when I was, you know, for as long, I've always been an avid reader, and all I've read is action adventure, you know, hard here to hard hitting heroic kind of stories. So I think it's the only story I know how to tell. I guess I guess you you kind of live vicariously through your characters, right? And oh yes, my characters are all are all very stronger than a lot stronger than I am, and they have much more hair. Well, it's who we aspire to be, right? Yeah, nothing nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, you were a firefighter for 15 years. I, I read that. And uh, so a lot of excitement. Like, how do you deal with the, yeah, some that always, always, I always, yeah. Something I always wonder is like, when you're like the first time hunter or something like that, you go out and, you know, you're, you're, you're aimed up at a deer or something like that. And I know like the first time, like my pulse is like pounding through my uh, neck, you know, and you're just, whatever, how do you deal with kind of the adrenaline and kind of process that? And, you know, I mean, obviously over time, you know, it gets easier and easier till it's like nothing, but how do you prepare for the unforeseen kind of thing? You know, when it more than you're used to, is there a way you calm yourself down or how do you get into it? Well, you know, you, there's, there's prescribed training that you had to go through even, even then when, when I was doing it. So you're trained on the, the basics of fire behavior and how to put fires out and how to do medical stuff and all of that. And the first thing you realize is that nobody ever follows those rules. Nothing you encounter comes from any of the scenarios that you actually practiced. So um, my approach to it always was that, well, okay, I'm the best they're going to get. And I have, I have to figure out how to bring order to this chaos. And that was what was so intoxicating about it. When I was, I started that when I was about 23, 22. And, and you have no response, I was single. I have no responsibilities. I had a crappy job. And, and here at, at 22 years old, I walk into the worst moments in people's lives and it's my responsibility to make it better. And when it works, which happened far more often than when it didn't, it, there's just no higher high than that. And it, it, you know, all of a sudden, you know, a shift at the firehouse becomes three straight days at the firehouse and trying to run as many calls as you can. It was, uh, so how do you, how do you deal with it? You adapt. You realize that, that what has happened is done. Even if it's my mistake, it's done. So now we have to move on because you can't undo it. And that kind of mindset is, I think, valuable in life, actually. Um, and I, I just, I bought into it. Yeah, no, I think I definitely uh, have that same approach to life. I, I like the application here. 
I, uh, I, I know I always threw a uh, boot camp. <clears throat> I went in, I was 21. So I was an old man when I went to boot camp, I was in the Navy and, uh, I, I, I don't know. I found it very kind of peaceful in a way where they just kind of, they make every decision for you. I'm like, I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to worry about, you know, paying my bills when I'm going to go to the bathroom, when I'm going to shower, I don't have to, <laughs> they're going to tell me I, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't matter, but that, and then I've kind of, you know, applied that approach in my life of, you know, I can't change the past, which is, you know, what you were saying, it, it kind of is what it is. And you just kind of, you know, all right, that decision is made. And, and I think it annoys my wife. She, uh, she dwells on, you know, things and, and it annoys her that she can't like simply let things go, you know, in that same way of, you know, I'm like, I made a decision. I can't do anything about it. All I can do is, all right, what's my best move from here? You know? And I think that's definitely a, a, a positive approach. Um, on the topic of, of writing a little bit, like one of the things I look for when I'm reading, uh, um, the novels and stuff is I always, <clears throat> I mean, I love it if it's every, every chapter or something, but I kind of want to take away something that I didn't know. Some, e even if it's just hearing somebody say something really clever or whatever, or whether it's just, you know, um, I, I think in that novel, uh, Patriots, uh, the guy talked about like, oh, you know, thermite and, you know, putting that together and, and doing that. And they were making these little like thermite grenades that they were setting places. And it was just like, oh, it's nice to have like a little takeaway or, or, you know, a better idea with a shelter building or something. I like, you know, I'm always looking for that. You taught me something, you know, I don't want my time to be, you know, wasted or lost. And, and I think that's, you know, and, and I got that though. I was with, uh, you know, reading your, your most recent series, the Victoria Emerson series here, I, I definitely saw some of that, you know, where it's, I, I'm like, oh, you know, that's interesting. I didn't know about that or that that's a cool way to approach that. You know, I'm always looking for that extra something. Well, I think we all are, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's, there's an old saying that, that there's more truth in fiction than there is in nonfiction. Uh, nonfiction has a lot of facts and fiction has a lot of truth. That's very self-serving, obviously, although I have written both. Um, as, as the writer, you know, it, that's not something I can intend to do. You know, if, if, if you set out to educate an audience, I think it's, it gets, for me, the writing gets boring and it, it sort of becomes flat. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you create a world and you put in enough detail and uh, it, it turns out being educational in some ways, uh, that, that's, that's worthwhile. I find it, it, the other series I write is Jonathan Grave thriller series. He's a freelance hostage rescue specialist, former spec op guy. And there I find that there's a danger in tipping over into too much detail. So there's, I'm a gun guy. I've always been a gun guy. But if you tip over into what I call, with great respect, gun porn, you end up losing. You 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 give you give a lot of good knowledge and and you get enthusiastic response from a very small slice of the audience. And then I hear from others that well, those are the pages that that I skip. So for me, it's it's try to find a a delicate balance between uh, the the factual detail-y kind of stuff and just telling the damn story. Get lost in the weeds, I guess, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, and meaning no disrespect, I, I devoured Tom Clancy's books when, when he was writing them. But some of them, you know, once they became five, six inches thick, uh, he went into level of, of detail and stuff that I think tipped the other way, just for my taste. Obviously, he's done much better in death than I have done in life in terms of, uh, selling books, but it's, it's a balance. Yeah. I guess you can't please everybody is, is how it goes. Um, now when we were talking a little earlier, you said that you really try and go with the approach of, uh, kind of rebuilding and aftermath, like, especially in this most recent series. And, uh, 
you know, it, it's more kind of the recovery. I think, you know, when we discussed it, you'd mentioned people kind of have that as a prepper, that kind of bunker mindset of, oh yeah, I'm just going to stay in my house and, and, you know, board up the walls and I have enough food and bullets. I'll last forever. And they always have this kind of fantasy. And I, you know, I, I think every military story ends with, uh, you know, everything, you know, is planned out till the first shot or whatever that, you know, it never goes the way you expect it. Right. Right. Exactly. It and no good plan survives the first <clears throat> shot. Exactly. Um, the, the prepper community, which by the way, you know, if there's ever been a period in American history where perhaps the, the, the shine that has been thrown at the prepper community as being something other than people who are preparing, I, I think maybe some eyes are opening up in terms of, Hey, that's not a bad idea to, um, to have some extra toilet paper, right? If in case there's another disease that comes by or weapons or whatever. But, you know, it, it occurs to me that the, uh, you, you obviously want to be prepared. I am certainly prepared. I live out in, in the wilds of West Virginia. Um, but suppose you're not home when it hits. Or suppose, you know, it's, you've, you've taken care of you and yours in any apocalypse, whether it's a nuclear war or anything else, if if billions of people are killed, billions of people are still going to be alive, and they are all they all have a need to survive. There's there's no greater instinct in the world than survival, and so few people are prepared for any of this. Um, in my mind, I envision this this sort of um, not zombies, but kind of, you know, all these people who have turned feral and are willing to kill anybody for anything. So that's when you're in your bunker and you're hunkered down, but you can't shoot everybody who comes up, you know, in to, to get you. The um, And I think they're really difficult choices. If, if, uh, if, if you have you, not you, you, but the, the, general you, if you have an oversupply of baby formula and some family comes up and they've got a starving baby, you know, there's, there's no right choice or wrong choice, but you know, at some point society has to come back together. Not only do we have this great desire to survive, we are social creatures. Even the most introverted person on the planet seeks out the company of other people. And so what the, the Victoria Emerson series imagines is not only the, the 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 feral elements of society that have to be tamed, you know, justice becomes something entirely different than following the law in that circumstance. Uh, but what Victoria is able to do in her little town of Ortho, West Virginia, which is a, a fictional town, uh, she's able to sort of bring order to the chaos to 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 find that area in the middle of what's what's fair to the existing citizens of the town, but also how do you not just reject other people who are coming into the town? Uh, what do you expect them to do? And in her case, it's, all right, here's here's a week's worth of provisions. And after that, you're on your own. You figure out a way to, to contribute to the society and then continue to, to earn money. It's a, it's a different form of, of currency. And that whole process has certainly opened my eyes to well, what the hell do you do? And uh, so I forget what your original question was, actually. But <laughs> now we're just, you know, focusing on how community kind of can come together, like in that apocalypse kind of world, like you said. Um, like one of the things like I, I thought about is, you know, like reaching out to the local firehouse, talking to them about their generators. People were, uh, you know, worried about um, EMPs and solar flares and all this other stuff. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'd heard is, you know, hey, you could talk to them about their generators. And uh, even, you know, people were like storing extra circuit boards and, hey, look, I'll pay for that as my, you know, community uh, donation kind of thing. And different things to kind of, bring people together. But I think little gestures that you do in your area can kind of buy you the credibility later. 
you know, as, you know, if things go bad or whatever. Um, I used to definitely be focused on kind of my own world and protecting mine. Just, I don't know, people tend to frustrate me more and more. And uh, as I get older and grumpier, you know, I, I don't know, you probably can't relate, but oh, yeah. that's how oh, yeah, I, I can. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, my, <laughs> yeah. Um, but then uh, my wife started, we have, we, we moved down here. She has like a uh, flower farm and uh, um, I'm an electrician for a big company. And uh, anyway, she uh, grows flowers and goes to these farmers markets and we're like such a small town. I mean, it's like, you know, a, a hardware store that's also a auto parts store and whatever. And, you know, and even it, that is, you know, like tiny, and then we have a uh, post office and that's about it for 20 miles, you know, and um, the, uh, you know, so now I go to these farmers markets and the mayor's there and whatever. And we chat it up because I don't know, it's what we do. And, you know, getting involved and getting to know everybody, I'm kind of realizing more and more that that's a way better approach of getting familiar, involving your community. And, you know, when you know each other, and you can kind of organize and come up with a plan, things work out a lot better than trying to brave the world on your own. You know, I imagine unless you're, you know, 20 miles into the woods, you always kind of run that risk uh, in a horrible situation where people come looking for to steal stuff or, you know, roving uh, mobs looking for food, you know, whatever it is. It's, you know, you really can't get away from it. And I think depending on your neighbors and coming up with ways to get organized and be useful with each other is definitely a, a more positive approach. I agree. And I also think it's, it's the approach <clears throat> for community planning. It's hard to get people to talk in terms of, you know, apop apocalyptic planning because, you know, it, it's just, first of all, it's very unpleasant. And you know, what, right. what are the chances? However... A tornado is an apocalypse. Right. A flood is an apocalypse. And right. I, I think it comes up to individuals, particularly in this community, the, the prepper community. You have thought of things that no politician has thought of yet because they just haven't gone to that space. And I, and I think that people are hesitant to get involved. And I've, I'm not d delving into politics. It does, it's not one party versus the other. But, you know, communities are run by, you know, the, the civil servants. And everybody has something to offer. So I think in, in terms of getting dialed into your community, I've actually never thought about this before. Um, people should attend the local board of supervisors meeting or whatever you call it in, in your community and bring right. these things up right. and, and at least get maybe influence some of these people to think that, yeah, okay, we do need more generators or um, we do need a tanker for the fire department because the one they've got is old and the folks out in the, in the hinterlands are going to burn to the ground if they can't get water. So I, community involvement before the fact is so much more helpful than criticism after the fact for people not thinking the brilliant thought that I've had all along. Like, well, one of the things that I look at, I mean, like you said, I mean, it doesn't take much to be a disaster. You know, you had mentioned a tornado, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I mean, look at uh, Puerto Rico, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. that was <clears throat> devastating. And it's funny, I had some listeners that, you know, came back and were like, hey, you know, these different things you would taught me, you know, over the years or suggested ended up really paying off, you know, huge and, you know, being able to help out the neighbors with that. You know, how often have we seen the government rolls in with FEMA and stuff and they just can't distribute anything or they can't, you know, get anything out to people? You know, we all have these big government plans, but government isn't always as efficient as, you know, we like to pretend they are. Um, but I, I think just not being able to get fuel, not being able to, you know, one of these little crises is for three weeks is a big deal. Um, in New York, I think, uh, I, I lived in New York before here, like, I, I don't know, it was probably about 15 years ago, we had that power outage that went for about three days or oh, whatever, yeah. maybe four days, but it was pretty much, you know, the majority of the state or 
the relevant half of the state. Well, I'll, I'll say it. I'll get in trouble. But uh, <laughs> anyway, but that kind of thing is devastating and, and nobody has access to stuff. Another thing I keep seeing is like China, if you look at, at what they're putting out with their propaganda to the people, they're like, oh yeah, we would do an EMP to America all day long. We're planning it. And, you know, I keep reading these articles. They have these like ridiculous press releases like, oh, America never come up to us because the first thing we do is a cyber attack and an EMP and they go through it. And we have that so far down on our radar as a country. And I mean, I'm not crazy. I think it's a one in a thousand chance that something like that could happen. It's not like, oh, I think, you know, any day now, it's just a matter of time. But it's, there's a lot of things where covering for the downside takes not that much effort. And, you know, it, even if it's just so I can beat inflation, you know, yeah, I have a good supply of food and toilet paper and whatever, but at least, you know what, what I paid for it compared to what it costs now, I mean, heck, as a prepper, right, bullets. The fact that I maybe had a few extra bullets and what they cost now, I'm looking pretty smart. You know, my wife's like, really, you should have bought more. I don't know why you didn't, you know, and I'm like, exactly. The you problem know? now is you feel bad going to the range because you end up shooting, you know, the, your your supply of cheap ammunition yes. and you're going to have to replace it with, with uh, uh, the, the more expensive stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely hurts. Um, but that's the thing. I think a little forethought and, and, you know, planning that way is, is so much more practical. I think, uh, w when Glenn Beck on his show or whatever, he used to talk about the food storage, you know, whatever they're selling at the, the given day, he'd be like, you know, even if you lose your job or your neighbor, you know, loses their job or whatever. You can, you're, you have an opportunity to help out. Hey, I have extra stuff. Here's a bag of groceries or whatever. You know, that little bit of being prepared is not a pl bad place to be. You know, when the power goes out, having the flashlights or the generator set up, that kind of thing. It's it, and people don't think like that as a as a whole. And then it's funny because the government had put out. I, I don't know. I think it was back under Obama. They were always talking about, you know, that, that veterans should be on the watch list and different things and preppers and anybody who has, you know, two weeks of food storage that those are crazy people. And then you go to ready.gov and it tells you to do all these things that the preppers are supposedly doing. And you're like, wait a minute, I'm just doing what the government suggests we do. But I guess it's nobody really takes that seriously or is supposed to, you know? Well, and a lot of the, the practical stuff doesn't even have to be spun in that in the in the scary prepper kind of thing. Um, uh, having a garden, if it doesn't take, we're not talking a farm, right? We're talking a garden where you grow vegetables. And this is one of the reasons I just recently moved out here into West Virginia. One of the things that I have planned, I have never been a gardener. But in writing the Victoria Everson series and in thinking things through, I think, well, okay, that's that's really something I need to learn how to do. And not just growing stuff is easy. Keeping the deer from feasting on it is a little harder. But the technical skill of, of I don't know how to can, uh, I'm going to. And in that case, it's fun. And and let's be honest with you, the the, the vegetables you pick up in the grocery store don't taste like the vegetables of my childhood. You know, tomatoes don't taste like tomatoes used to from the grocery store. They're pretty and they're red and they taste like nothing. So that all of that, mm -hmm. I think, is, is a very positive spin on what you're doing. Prepping is essentially taking care of your family. And there's nothing wrong with taking care of your family either. It's, it gets, a, for me, I get a little uncomfortable when it tips over into, um, focusing on keeping people away, although that's a critical element of it, of, of the survival thing. But it, it, I, 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 in, my, in my estimation, it should be a lesser paragraph of the plan than how do, how do we survive? How do we, and it's not a matter of keeping, you obviously want to have a supply of food, but a freezer full of meat with a generator um, 
will last you <laughs> quite a while. Um, you're not going to have feasts like you used to beforehand, mm -hmm. um, but that's going to last you quite a while. And a bunch of vegetables from your own garden is going to last you for quite a while. And that's all part of, of the prepping process and having a plan. You know, we always had when my son is now 35, but when he was uh, younger and he was going off to college um, quite a distance away, it was right around 9-11 and uh, which was a shocker. I, I worked, I lived near DC at the time in Northern Virginia and nobody could get home. Mm -hmm. I was writing at the time, so it didn't matter to me in terms mm -hmm. of the commute, but everybody got separated and there, you have, hear all these horror stories. So we established a family plan that there was a landmark that we all knew. And that on the first Monday of the month, um, we will, we'll gather there at noon on the first Monday of the month. And and that's where we'll find each other. And if we don't find each other on the first Monday of February, then we'll try it on the first Monday of March. And you keep going until until you stop, you know, until you're ready to give up or until whatever. But the idea of having a plan to to reunite a family, I think, is really important. That's important in a shopping mall if you got little kids. You know, if you get separated, I want to I'll find you at the little jungle gym or whatever, you know. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. the prepping is just planning. No, that definitely sounds right. I mean, that's a, a little forethought, you know, putting things together and, and coming up with action steps is definitely, and nobody does it. Nobody, you know, I, I think people get caught up in that it's uncomfortable. You know, I, I, I get uneasy when I think about, I mean, not me personally, turns out this is what I do all the time, but you know, people, <laughs> I always hear from the wife or whatever, let, let's not talk about, you know, um, you know, horrible things happening. You know, I don't want to have to carry a concealed carry handgun or I don't want to, you know, different things because I, I don't want to think about those things. Well, just because you don't think about it doesn't mean it's not, you know, happening. It's like people who ignore all their debt building up and getting away from them. You know, yeah, it's uncomfortable. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to, you know, I don't open the mail anymore because the bills come and it's stressful, you know that that's the same thing. I just don't want to be blind to things and, and ignore it. Um, as far as the garden, um, that's a big thing. Like just learning the skills to be able to share with other people, I think is huge. And, you know, one of the things I thought was pretty intelligent and I hadn't seen in a lot of the books is, you know, you talk about how, I mean, in, in other books, you, you talk about how, uh, people don't have the skills to clean a deer or to, you know, to plant a garden or whatever, you know, they, they come in and, Hey, well, we were never trained on that, you know, and that's, that's a big thing. People don't know how to do it. And, you know, in our mind, it's nothing to start a garden. And I agree with you. Everybody can do it and everybody can get there. But as you are maybe experiencing now is when you first do it, you're like, first, hey, what really grows here? What does it? You know, and, and sometimes, yeah, I can grow tomatoes here, but it might be a different variety than I'm used to growing mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, you have to make adjustments based on your climate. Your soil is different. You have different predators, you know, the groundhog or the, you know, the deer or, you know, whatever's getting in there in New York. It was, believe it or not, we'd have chipmunks just come in and take like every tomato out of the the garden and it was ridiculous. Whereas here it's never been an issue. We had, I've fought groundhogs constantly in New York and not really a thing here, you know, here it's rabbits all the time and whatever, you know, it's just, you learn what you need to deal with and you set up maybe the appropriate infrastructure, the right fencing, or, you know, we ended up in New York planting a garlic around our apple trees and things like that to keep the deer away different things, you know, you learn the tricks that work and you also learn what grows really well, you know, oh, you know, when I do garlic, I can get tons and, you know, whatever, we get tons of tomatoes here, but I can't grow this or, but you learn what you can actually do and what works for your family and you adjust your diet and your cooking strategies to figure it out. This stuff is a process where just having a bag of seeds and saying, well, yeah, I'll do a garden if that time comes. You know, by actually getting out and doing things, I think you end up really developing those skills a little bit more and, you know, 
making it a real thing. That's how it always is. You know, it's go camping, go do things, you know, where you actually use the skills, start a fire, find out how hard it is to start a fire after it rained. You know, nobody really thinks about these things until you go do it. And that's the big thing with prepping is just go experience it. And then being able to share those skills with your community is, you know, huge. And like I said, having a little network where you kind of know people helps. Well, and I find in this, of course, I don't want to get too far with my skis here because I haven't done it yet. But in, in we have a place we're going to put the garden. We've cleared out trees, so there should get a lot of sun. But we have, it's a little bigger than the hardware store you talk about, but it's in the same vein of that where you, you can buy um, seeds, saws, or handguns. You know, it's kind of the that kind of general mm -hmm. purpose uh, hardware store. Yeah. And in those stores in the country, I have found, I've, I've done a lot of domestic traveling, there's always that guy. And he's normally of a certain age. He's kind of grisly. And he knows he can answer every question that you want to ask. And they're more than happy to talk about what grows and what doesn't, what makes sense and what doesn't. But if you plant this, don't plant this next to it. And uh, so ask the questions. You know, seek out the, the, the answers to the, the questions that you have and try to, try to get ahead of the mistakes that you're going to make. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I definitely have like the giant like prepper library, but I find that so much more you know, it is getting out and doing, you know, I have every book in the, the world on pretty much everything, you know, first aid and, and, you know, they have, uh, the UN has like war medicine and all these different books that go into, you know, surgery out in the field without everything. And this is stuff I don't know about and whatever, but I'm like, yeah, at the end of the world, I'm going to find the right guy and be like, yeah, here are the extra books that, you know, you need to, you know, whatever. But I think building the network of friends, you know, like you said, so you have the guy like, you know, you're saying you have the guy who's done the gardening and grown it all and done it there. That's have the guy that's the the medical guy and, and kind of push him in the direction of, you know, there, there's a book, uh, I think it's actually just called Survival Medicine. And uh, anyway, the idea is, it's written by a doctor and his wife, I think is a nurse practitioner and the two of them wrote this book, but it talks about applying all the, uh, the medical stuff to stuff that's accessible to you. You know, you don't have a pharmacy or the right to go buy morphine or different things, but there's all kinds of different and they find ways to apply what you have access to and kind of look at the old school remedies and things like that. And I think that, you know, seeking out that knowledge now while it's accessible and then actually applying it, you know, putting different things into practice in your life or when you go to do things, you're like, hey, I don't have these resources available to me. It makes a big, you know, step in the right direction. You know, once you realize what you need and, you know, spending 10 bucks on Amazon right now might be a game changer later in the one thing that you were missing, you know, the one step. Yeah, the the medical side of things, I, I think that gets kind of wishy. I mean, the um, I was I'm fortunate to have had training at stale training, but I don't think we've evolved past the, the, the biological systems that I understand. And um and I have gone through this scenario in my head too. I carry it. I go to the range a lot and I do They're they're big boy ranges. We don't have our range safety officers walking all around. So I don't think there's a high likelihood of getting shot, but you know, it's thing stuff happens. Right. So I carry a trauma kit in my car and two trauma kits actually, but that's a long story how that happened. Um, and I've asked myself, so what is my trauma? They're very expensive. So what is my trauma kit for? If, uh, and I, this hasn't come up, I'm no longer certified to help anybody. But if I wander up on an auto accident or something like that, um, if 911 works, uh, do I do I apply the the resources for my trauma kit on on a stranger, or do I just do? Am I going to walk away, or do I help him otherwise? These are the kind of questions with five exclamation points. If 
if the balloon goes up and if, if this stuff goes real, what what do you protect? And the finite resources, I think, would be the very first things you have to protect. Uh, if if you've got, you know, five dozen jars of homemade tomato sauce, then yeah, you might want to go ahead and share a little for somebody else's pasta. But um, I, these are the really hard questions. And this is why I try to contemplate through the books is it, it's, it's less about uh, the Victoria Emerson series is it, the Crimson Phoenix and, and Blue Fire, the, the two books in the series so far. I'm writing White, White Smoke is the one I'm writing now. And it's a, they're small stories. They're about individual survival stories within this global apocalypse. And it's been really interesting exploring these things. For You talked about trying to learn something or hoping to learn something through reading a book. Writing these books has really made me rethink a lot of things and I have learned through them and done a fair amount of, of introspection about, and as a, you know, a former firefighter and all that, I've sort of been trained and it's my nature to want to help people. And, but I also believe in what I call the concentric circle theory, which is I protect me and my family first, and then others are, are welcome to, to join. They, they're the outer circles. But as soon as that inner circle becomes threatened, everybody else becomes expendable. So um, the, they're really hard choices. And as far as preparing for medical stuff, okay, you, yeah, I don't know potions and powders and plant-based medicines. I know that it's worked for hundreds of years. I don't know any of that. But I'm going to guess it takes a fair amount of effort to put it together. So is that is that for your family, as you envision it, is that for your family or is that for the, the bleeding stranger on the side of the road? Well, it's funny because I was actually just talking to a buddy at work about this. And <clears throat> I'd over the years, you know, I started out in the Boy Scouts as a kid and, you know, you do your first aid merit badge and your different stuff. Um, did the lifeguard thing where you have CPR and all that. Then later on, I did uh, some stuff with, uh, with um, <clears throat> um, dealing with uh, like uh, let me think uh, the whole kind of like recovering people from the whole sex trade kidnapping thing. Oh right, right, right. And dealt with some groups on that. There's that underground railroad and like that, and uh, and we did a lot of first trade training with that. I, I did stuff with actually a, a SWAT medical team that trained me that stuff. And it, like you said, it becomes stale over the years. You know, it. it you, you get past that. And then now I'm doing uh, at work, they're like, oh, all the electricians have to do this whole big Red Cross thing. And man, their biggest priority was getting consent before you even like look at anybody. <laughs> they're like, you can't decide if somebody's choking until you have consent that it's okay. And I'm like, really? I'm like, they can't talk and you're telling me their hands are around their throat, but <laughs> I need consent to f ask them if they're choking. I'm like, I feel like we could get that one out of the way without. And uh, it's funny because the training, all the videos, they didn't even like update that. Like nobody asked consent in all the scenarios. They're like, yeah, this is how you do it. But the first question is, what's step one? And if you skip, you know, get consent. Anyway, I thought it was funny. But anyway, I do, like you said, I, I carry a trauma bag in in every one of and and i mean the little like ifac kind of kid yeah. not you know anything involved but the the tourniquet and the you know chest seal and some quick clock gauze and in each of the cars and i have one uh like out by my barn so again out where i'm shooting usually so it's kind of nearby no i don't foresee it i don't imagine i play with guns all day long but because I play with guns all day long, there is some inherent danger, you know, that's, you know, possibly you're exposed to. And also axes and tools and farm equipment and who knows. But so I do all that. I keep it. I definitely go with the approach of, oh, I see a vehicle, whatever. I'm going to stop and, and help out that guy. I'm with you. And but again, as things go on, you know, and you kind of addressed it in your book. When you come across, do you give up your medical supplies for somebody who you don't think really can be saved? 
um, you can save them in the world before, but if they're not going to have access to a real doctor in five days or less, that's kind of a thing that you might be just kind of throwing away your stuff. Right. Um, one of the other things that you kind of touched on that, that I was kind of in my head, um, you know, thinking about and, and kind of spitballing, I guess is, is that, uh, when you come up to people, say you have the confrontation and you're four or five guys and you all have guns and there's maybe four or five guys who are less trained on the other side and you're all, you know, out there dealing with each other. When you decide to engage somebody just because they're doing something bad or they're stealing or they're doing whatever, even if you're sure that your, your guys can take their guys, you still run the risk that somebody you care about could get shot. Somebody you care about could disappear and, you know, their world be ended because you're trying to right this other injustice. And finding that balance is very hard and also figuring it out in the moment. You know, when everything's tense and stressful, a lot of people, I always kind of, you know, they say you war game it or whatever. I like to play out these scenarios and have these discussions beforehand. You know, when, when I talk to my audience, we're always, you know, going through these different scenarios of you need to decide before who are you willing to help? How far are you willing to go? And these are your resources. These are what you have available to you. And having somebody else live three more days and it might cost your family, you know, a week or something with your supplies, or it might cost your child their life by you not having those medical supplies available to you. You have to weigh these things out, but that also doesn't mean you become cold and... Well, there are practical decisions that have to be made. And, and I would tell you from even now, before anything apocalyptic, if there's a mass casualty incident, you know, buses collide or plane crash, whatever the case may be. Uh, mass shooting, whatever. Um, I was trained as part of the triage process, which is what that is. You know, triage is is the ones the most serious get treated first. The one most serious who probably aren't going to make it, you know, and ignore them. You make them comfortable, and then the the broken arms and and such are sort of at, at the end of the line. So one of the things I was taught to do, I never had to deploy this, was you get on the loudspeaker of the fire truck and you say, everybody who needs to go to the hospital, go gather at that place, the, the landmark that's nearby. And people are going to get up and, and wander and they go to the bottom of the list of who goes to the hospital because they could hear, understand and respond. So therefore, they're doing better than the ones who are on the ground and can't do that. So the, the mindset is not is not unique to the prepper community. It's it's been around, you know, all all the time. And it's and it's essential. Uh, these are the choices that have to be made. And when you talk about drawing the line and, and laws, and I mentioned before the difference between law and, and justice, we live in a community now. I mean, in the United States, it's it's got its problems, but it's a hell of a lot better than a lot of other places on, on the planet. And um, I would say the best of all the places on the planet. But our system of laws and our perception of justice has evolved over a thousand years, you know, started in, in, the, in, in Europe and the Western mindset has, has always been what it is. So now, you know, it's, you, you don't shoot somebody, you don't use um, lethal force on somebody who is just stealing stuff because you just don't do that. Well, okay. That's driven by courts, and that's driven by my knowledge that that person can be arrested and will be put in jail or whatever the case may be, that, that some justice will be done. If you take that infrastructure out, as what I imagine in the Victoria Emerson series, um, justice looks different. You know, thieves, they're finite resources that have been, people have worked very, very hard to get their finite resources. And because it's finite, if a thief takes your, your thing, you can't replace that thing. And there has to be some form of justice 
brought. And as, as I imagine it, that's where corporal punishment comes in. You know, there's, there's a, jails are a, are a convenience of modern society. We don't have whipping posts anymore. We don't have, you know, that, that stuff that you see in, in movies of, of, of the old days because we have an alternative. If you take those alternatives away, you still have to wrangle people. You know, we, you've got you've got good guys, you got bad guys, you got people who are ready, who are far more calm in these circumstances, and you have the people who are panicking, and 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 creating havoc. So all of this has to be tamed, and to find the way to do it is takes a very strong leader, and that's who Victoria Everson is. Let's figure out how to how to thread that needle. No, I mean, that's it. It's always about balance and it's just trying to find your way in it. Um, so, uh, yeah, not to take up your whole morning here. Tell us, uh, so tell us about this book. Tell us about, I guess, the whole new series here and, and, uh, and what we need to do to go make it happen. Well, if you go to johngillstrap.com, that's a good place to start. And uh, I don't sell books from the website, but it'll give you links to every place you need to go if, if you're interested in, in doing it. And links to my YouTube channel and other things as well. The um, the Victoria Emerson series is just what we've been discussing. It, Victoria, uh, she's a single mom of three boys, 18, 16, and 14. And uh, her husband was killed in, in, in the sandbox. And she is the representative for the uh, one of the districts in, in West Virginia. And as the war is about to happen, it's kind of a precautionary measure. The, the trigger of all of this was Israel was going to nuke Iran's nuclear launch sites. And as a, in an abundance of caution, the United States government relocated to a bunker uh, in West Virginia which by the way, is a real thing. It was a real thing until 1994 when the Washington Post revealed the secret. Um, it was located at the Greenbrier Resort in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. So I have the Hilltop Resort in, in an unidentified town in West Virginia. And <clears throat> Victoria is going there for the continuation of government. It's a, it's a bomb-proof underground facility. And then she finds out she can't bring her kids. It's only, which was true back in the day. You, they, Every member of Congress could bring one staff member, but no family. So with 535 members of the House and Senate, that's one staff member. That's over a thousand people, plus the staff that mans the bunker. It's a lot of people with medical facilities and food and water and electricity and climate control for a minimum of 60 days. Well, she says, no, I'm not going to survive while my kids potentially fry. And, um, and then the war does happen. And she uh, and her family have always been preppers, and she's kind of uniquely positioned to um, to not panic and and to be able to survive. And they wander into this little town of Ortho, which is in chaos when she arrives, and just kind of because she's the outsider and she's a natural leader, she's able to bring order to the chaos. But there are a lot of bad people out there who are trying to disrupt. We're we're uh, trying to get involved in the society that she's established, but they haven't earned their place into that society. And that often goes to violence. So it's all about the balance. And it's, it's been fascinating. I like it. Now you said you have an, and that's, uh, what are the two books? It's, uh, that the first one is Crimson Phoenix titles? came out last year and uh, Blue Fire just came out last month. Excellent. Now, I've actually, uh, uh, I'm, I've read the first one, and I'm three quarters of the way through the uh, second one, and definitely enjoying it. Definitely a lot of great stuff in there. Now, you said you have a uh, another series for uh, people who like guns more. Yeah, Where do I want to go do. for that? What's that one? Uh, same website, johngillstrap.com. That's the Jonathan Grave thriller series. The most recent one is called Stealth Attack, and I'm now writing the 15th book. One five fifteenth book in that series. Wow! And it'll come out in um, uh, Lethal Game is the is the name of that. That starts with a an assassination attempt on Jonathan and and his buddy. Jonathan Grave is a freelance hostage rescue specialist. He's 
former Delta operator who's really wealthy because his father was a career criminal. And uh, he's the guy you hire if, if your loved one is taken here or abroad and you just want to get them back. And uh, unlike, it's, I don't know if people know this, but the, for the FBI hostage rescue team, which is a, a fabulous group of folks, I know a number of them, uh, but their mission in a hostage taking is to make sure the bad guy doesn't get away. It is not, obviously they want to rescue the hostage, but they consider, I've heard this from two of these guys, they consider a hostage taking to be a homicide in slow motion. They have very little expectation or they have, that overstates it. Uh, hear what I mean, not what I'm saying. <laughs> the uh, careers are ruined if the bad guy gets away on a technicality, you didn't get the right warrant, you didn't get the right permission, you know, whatever the case may be, or, or he just runs away. That's where careers are ruined. If the hostage is killed, not so much, as long as the bad guy is in, in custody. With the, the SF units, uh, SEAL Team and, and, and Delta and others, the primary mission is rescuing the hostage. And everything else, the intel and all that is, is secondary. So Jonathan's mission on all of these in, in these books is to separate the, the good guys from the bad guys. And it doesn't usually end well for the bad guys, but his skills are such and his connections are such that he often does a lot of stuff for uh, Uncle Sam that Uncle Sam's not allowed to do. It's, a, it's, a, it's an award-winning, best-selling series. So that's Jonathan Grave. The next one is Lethal Game in July. The one last July was Stealth Attack. And the first one for that series was which one? The very first one in that series was No Mercy back in 2009, I think. No, I like it. You got to start at the beginning is my theory. I don't know. Or is it one of those you can kind of jump in? No, you can jump in. It's not really the the Grave series isn't really a series so much as it is a series of a bunch of standalone thrillers with recurring characters. It's not it's it's not a continuing story. It's just the same characters, kind of along the lines of a, of a of a Jack Reacher. And and he never ages. I made that decision early on that uh, theoretically, in in my mind, the books could the stories could actually happen out of order within the series. So it's, but they're a lot of fun. Just seeing how people approach problems and, and different things, you know, it's nice to consider lots of different stuff and who doesn't like action and excitement. I mean, I don't know what else you'd want. I appreciate it. Appreciate you taking your time because uh, it's been a real pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. To do and you guys have questions. Um, if you have questions for John, what's uh, you want emails, that kind of thing, or somewhere sure. they can put, Questions, comments on your website or send me questions to John, John at John com, And that's uh you want to find those books. It's John I mean, you find the information of what's out there and I guess Amazon. I know I got the books on, uh, on audible. It's where I found them. Um, you guys have questions for me, concerns, comments, prepping badass at gmail.com. Um, Otherwise, stay safe, and we'll talk to you guys next week. The Survival and Basic Badass Podcast is a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Mm-hmm.